you just remain standing, we're going to read from God's Word in Matthew uh, chapter 1, uh, verses 1 through 6. We're just taking a little bit of a detour from our time in the book of Acts to remember what Christ has done in his birth. And we're just going to take a look through the first 17 verses in the next three weeks of uh, Matthew's genealogy of Jesus. Matthew chapter 1, uh, verse 1. The book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham was the father of Isaac, and Isaac the father of Jacob. Jacob the father of Judah and his brothers. Judah the father of Perez and Zerah by Tamar. Perez the father of Ram of Hezron. Hezron the father of Ram. And Ram the father of Amminadab. Amminadab the father of Nishan. Nishan the father of Salmon. Salmon the father of Boaz by Rahab. And Boaz the father of Obed by Ruth. And Obed the father of Jesse. Jesse the father of David the king. Verse 17 says, So all the generations from Abraham to David were 14 generations, and from David to the deportation to Babylon, 14 generations, and from the deportation to Babylon to the Christ, 14 generations. Amen. may be seated. Well, as we come uh, to a time of celebration uh, of this Advent season, I was rereading the book of Matthew, just the first chapter, and was struck by verse 17 of the repetition of 14 generations from Abraham to David to the deportation of the Israelites in the exile to Jesus. And I thought, you know, as uh, Matthew takes us through these names, and these names are representative of so many stories of God's faithfulness and blessing, it would be good to reflect on that. Um, I, I've been uh, reminded of these things through uh, the really popular website, or at least I think it's gaining popularity, called 23andMe, which is the uh, DNA Ancestry site. And I thought, you know, that makes for an interesting uh, title for just an Advent series rather than 23andMe, 14andMe, 14 being the number of generations repeated three times. So as we look at that this morning, I think we're really going to see a couple of things that really come out from the the highlighted names of of Abraham and and David. And and if you go back and start to really think through what God promised in the Old Testament with Abraham and David, his his covenantal blessings, I think, come to the forefront right at the beginning of this chapter, the beginning of Jesus' uh, life. And that is, you know, if, if you remember from Abraham, all the families of the earth will be blessed through you. You take that blessing uh, as you remember his name and you connect it then to David, the, the enduring king, and you put them together and it's, it's basically, it's very, very simple. That through Jesus, the coming king, all the families of the earth will be blessed. And if you think about that really being the beginning of the book of Matthew, really the beginning of the gospels, it holds true. You read about Jesus' life and the beginning of his life really in his birth. All the families of the earth will be blessed through the coming of Jesus, the enduring king. So really, we're going to take that just as a a title head for this morning and look at a couple of things. I think the two highlighted names that right in verse 1 give us kind of a sense of where we should go with Abraham and David. And then to look at just a couple of the men that are in this this list. And then I think what deviates from, you know, most of Jewish history, that in the list there's not just men, but there's also women in this genealogy. And the women are put in there for a reason, for us to be able to look at and highlight and be able to learn something from. So the highlights from the the first two, and then men and women, as the way we're going to look at it this morning. So if you look at the very first verse here, just the top, book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. You know, you see that um, Jesus here has a genealogy, or what would literally be called the genesis of Jesus' family line. The beginning of these 14 generations. Now, if somebody looked at this and said, you know, how could it be that there's only three sets of 14 generations and thousands of years? Aren't you missing some of the names in this list? And the answer is, yes, we are. Matthew did something for us to help us. He gave us highlighted names and used the father of to to be a bit of a catch-all title, but made sure that the names that he put in there are the ones that we ought at least focus on. And the first two are the major landmark names, if you like, Uh, in the Old Testament. That is, if we get uh, turned around a little bit, we can always go back to those major landmarks. I was just, we were taking a trip as a family through Pennsylvania this past weekend for Thanksgiving. Pennsylvania basically has two major cities, right? 
the hated Pittsburgh, and then also on the other side, Philadelphia. Uh, we've heard people say that basically Pitt, Pennsylvania has, you know, Pittsburgh on one side, Philly on the other, and Alabama in the middle. And it's really true. You get off of the Turnpike or I-80, and you are somewhere in the country. And um, we did that, actually, because I missed an exit. And so we saw a lot more of Pennsylvania than we really wanted to. In fact, we were on our way to a very backwater town. Would have really been, I think, something like the Bethlehem of Bethlehem. We, were, we stayed in a place called Schwenksville. And I had no idea where that was until we arrived there. But it, it's actually a cute little town. And we, thankfully, we found it. It was a little more close to Philly than Pittsburgh, but whatever. Now, if you look at these names, then, David and Abraham, it's very easy to get lost in the Old Testament as it relates to the genealogy of Jesus. But what Matthew does here is he gives us these helpful major cities, major people names to be able to find our way. Jesus, of course, is the main character of the entire Bible here. And right at the front of the book of Matthew, the main character here, the genealogy of Jesus Christ. So we're supposed to understand something. That before you read that he is Jesus, the son of God, you see that he is also now Jesus, the son of David, the son of Abraham. So you're supposed to get something out of that, just that, that, that clue. That, as Spurgeon says, in ties of blood with sinners one, he shared humanity with us. That we understand that there is a line through which he's come from. Of course we understand he was born to a virgin, that Joseph was the husband of Mary, and um, the Bible goes through great pains to be able to describe that to us. But what Matthew does here is that he gives us a royal lineage through the line of Joseph's family, just so that we don't forget the fact that a king has come, even though he's come in very humble and obscure kinds of circumstances. David's name is the first major landmark in the list. And he was chosen by God, of course, to be a king who would reign forever. If you go back to 2 Samuel uh, chapter 7, verses 12 and 16, you see this. Samuel writes, when your days are fulfilled and fulfilled, you will lie down with your fathers. I will raise up uh, your offspring after you who shall come from your body, and I will establish his kingdom. And your house and your kingdom shall be made sure forever before me. And this is, this is the key phrase here, your throne shall be established forever. Okay, so the promise is given to David by God, your throne shall be established forever. But David went and, and, as the Old Testament says, he went and laid down with his fathers. He died. So what's he saying here? Well, your son will assume a throne. That was Solomon. He'll be raised up in the short run to build a house. But after Solomon will come one who will establish a throne forever. That would be Jesus. It's what we remember as we hear the faint music in the mall of Handel's Messiah. And he shall reign forever and ever. Ever and ever. The name of David here was a memory device. It was a way for us to understand something. That as you look through the Old Testament, you can cut through and see one of the most important names as it relates to Jesus. That he had a royal line that really began back with God's promise to David. If you take even David's name, just the consonants, D-V-D. It's very interesting what happens in the Hebrew language. One of the very few things that I, got, I remembered from Hebrew but there was a numerical way of remembering David being that important of a name. The consonantal values. If you take uh, D, it's the fourth letter in the Hebrew alphabet, Dalet. Okay, Aleph, Bey, Gimel, Dalet. And then He and Vav is the, is the letter V, is, is the numerical value of six. So if you take four, six, and four, you add it up, and what do you get? Fourteen. What does Matthew do by giving us this royal lineage? He gives us three repetitions of 14, a way of remembering how Jesus came through that royal line. Now, a lot of people get a little crazy on this, you know, like numerical value, Hebrew consonants. Oh, what's, what's the next key? I don't think there are that many. Really, there, there are, this is just a numerical consonantal device to help us remember David and the 14 generations. I, I think we all need, you know, sort of memory helps. So, when I was learning Hebrew, the only way I got back to this was, was memorizing the Hebrew alphabet to uh, Yankee Doodle Dandy. It's the only thing I got out of Hebrew, okay? And so as I sat in my office, I was trying to do the consonantal values, and I was, Aleph, Bait, and Gimel, Dad, He, and Vav, and Zion, Hayt, and Bait, and Yod, and Tav, and Yon, and You know, I was going through the song. 
It was, it was great. That's, that's like thousands of dollars and years in Hebrew for Yankee Doodle Dandy, and you probably could get that on the internet. Now, here's the memory device, though. 14, David is one of the names that we ought to remember. Really, we ought to remember it because as we think about Jesus, when we see him coming in a royal lineage through David's house, we're supposed to look at Jesus as a people and say, my Lord and my King. He is my Lord and he is my King. He is the ruler over all the living. He is the ruler over my life. So as we look at David now, we see the first major landmark on the map. Abraham is the second in the Old Testament. You remember the promise to Abraham and his line. It starts to come into view. Genesis 12, 1 to 3. God says to Abram, go to the land that I will show you and I will make of you a great nation And I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and him who dishonors you, I will curse. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Now, when you look at Abraham and his call, it looks almost unexplainable and nearly impossible. In fact, in Joshua 24, too, it says, Abraham Abraham was one one of the fathers, of course, But he used to worship other gods. When God called him out of Ur of the Chaldees, he was was actually engaged in worshiping idols. And you look at this and say, how could God do such a thing? Well, God loves to choose to despise things, the small things, to bring himself the glory to show his own power. You look at the situation in his life, it seems totally impossible. The Canaanites are already in the land. God, how are you going to fulfill a promise through one person that you're going to make a, a great nation when that great nation comes by way of a wife who is unable to bear children to go to a land that they don't even possess. Seemingly impossible, hopeless. How could you make this happen? Well, it only comes by way of his power. And what you learn is that that difficulty and seeming hopelessness were a necessary part of the program. Why? Because it's going to increase faith and dependence on the Lord. But baked into that, plenty of times all throughout the Old Testament, it seems like the deal is going to completely fall apart. And what happens? God does something to increase our faith and trust. If it were all so easy, if we were just supposed to sail through life without a care, where would the faith and trust be? Where would the dependence be? It'd be nowhere. Because we'd be completely reliant on ourselves. But what does he do in the Old Testament? He brings his people through these situations that seem utterly hopeless, seemingly impossible, and he bakes that into the story so that they will grow by faith. I was just reading a story about um, uh, Martin Lloyd-Jones, who was a very influential uh, medical doctor and and pastor in the UK in the mid-20th century, and he tells of a story about his father when Lloyd-Jones was 10, his father was selling some farm equipment. He was selling a piece called a separator. And he went on a trip with his dad. He was about 10 years old. And he went to sell this, this part to uh, a pair of brothers. The older brother was notoriously cheap. He never wanted to buy anything. The younger brother really wanted that part and was really keen on making the deal happen. So they took a six-mile trip into the country. And as they were turning down the lane to... Uh, the house where they would um, sell this part, or at least try, the younger brother came out and met them, uh, sort of unbeknownst to the older brother. And he said to them, look, in the middle of this deal, I'm going to speak against it. And they sort of looked at him. He said, don't misunderstand. I'm going to speak against it. So they listened, and then the younger brother disappeared, and they went in to negotiate the deal. And so there they are having this conversation. Of course, the older brother doesn't want the part at all. And as they're talking and talking and talking after making a six-mile trip, the whole thing looks completely hopeless. In comes the younger brother. And as things look completely hopeless, the younger brother comes and then therefore speaks even further against doing this deal. Now Martin is looking at his father, and as they look at one another, the older brother changes his mind. No, I think I want the part now. And so now the older brother is becoming convinced that they really, really need the part. And of course, then they sold the separator to the brothers. Because why? Well, the older brother didn't want to agree with his younger brother. And the younger brother knew that. 
So of course, he used that as part of the deal to get the part that he wanted all along. But the point that Lloyd-Jones was making was very, very simple, that it seems like difficulty and seeming hopelessness is baked in and part of the deal. It's part of the plan. And when you look at the Old Testament, especially with the patriarchs, it just seems over and over and over again, things are going to totally fall apart here. But difficulty and seeming, seeming hopelessness is all part of this plan where Abraham is going to receive that covenantal blessing. If you look at the Jesus' birth in the Gospels, if you're reading it for the first time, you might think the same thing. How is it that Jesus could end up in that place? Go down to Egypt. Go where he goes. Be born in a place where he's born to be on the run constantly. How is the Son of God ever going to come through circumstances like this? Survive and give his life as a ransom for many. But difficulty is part of the plan. If you think about your own story too, it's true. Difficulty. Circumstances that seem hopeless. It's part of the plan. Now you might say, why would that be such a part of the plan? You know, why, why couldn't God have chosen different circumstances? I don't know. But I do know that as he takes you through that difficulty, he knocks out every crutch that you might have to stand on so that you might depend on him more and more. You know, the, the, the tagline in the 23andMe website is to know your story in a new and personal way. And I think as we look at this genealogy, especially with these two landmarks, it's really to know his story through Abraham and David in a new and personal way for you. Because as, as you look at their stories, the, the, the difficulty, the seeming hopelessness, the, 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 the points where everything seems like it's going to fall apart, is actually part of what God uses to bring people to himself. And I think in the same way he's doing that with you. Part of this story is your story. Part, part of the family mess here of Jesus' line is indicative of all the family mess that we sometimes recognize, especially at the holiday season. But we look at that and we see something even better. We see a hope that God is working in the midst of it. The highlighted names are David and Abraham. And then you go through, uh, the, the, we look at the men's names. We're not going to look at all of them, just a few of them. But from the seeming hopelessness and, and difficulty of some of the men here in Abraham's line, God accomplishes what he said. I'm going to attempt to read these names again. Abraham, the father of Isaac, Isaac, the father of Jacob, Jacob, the father of Judah and his brothers, and Judah, the father of Perez and Zerah by Tamar, and Perez, the father of Hezron, and Hezron, the father of Ram, Ram, the father of Amminadab, Amminadab, the father of Nishan, Nishan, the father of Salmon. I'll stop there for a second. Again, my Old Testament is coming back now. All these names, some obscure, some that you'll recognize. Abraham, the father of Isaac, Isaac, the father of Jacob. One thing that Genesis shows us about the coming of the promise to Abraham, as it relates to Isaac and Jacob, is waiting, waiting, waiting. There's this constant sense of waiting in the, in the Old Testamental story of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. God says, I'm going to give you a son. I'm going to give you a family. But you're going to wait well past the point where it would be physically possible for you to do this. Why? Because I am going to show you how great I am through your body. That you, you won't ever look back at yourself and give yourself credit for what's going to take place. You can only give me credit. See, that's the way God is working here. He's, he's working through completely impossible circumstances so that he might show his glory and power that we might stand in all of it and say to ourselves, there is none like you. Through the waiting, the waiting is absolutely excruciating. Oh, Lord. In fact, you go from Abraham to Isaac. Isaac went through similar circumstances. I can't even say the word. Cir circumstances to Abraham. He had to wait. He had a wife who was unable to bear children for decades. There was a failure in the process. A seeming hopelessness. Family squabbling. There was temptations. What are we going to do? You know what you're going to do? Through the waiting, trust God. Who likes to wait? Nobody likes to wait. We were in New York City this past weekend. We waited for everything. You want to go to the bathroom? Wait. There's only two people ahead of you in line. Okay, great. That's not going to be that long. You know what happened? The lady got stuck in the bathroom. The manager of the, of the restaurant had to come out and sh he had to shimmy the door open. And then the line got longer. It was a, this narrow hallway. It was people in between. She had to do this walk of shame when she came out through the crowd. The crowd of people waiting. New York City 
cosmopolitan, no bathrooms at all. You know, it's like three bathrooms in the entire city. Everybody has to wait. It's excruciating. Well, I guess I can identify with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Now listen to Genesis 21, 1 and 2. Now, Yahweh looked out for Sarah as he said, and Yahweh did for Sarah as he promised. So Sarah became pregnant and gave birth to a son in her 90s at the appointed time, at the appointed time which God had promised him. That phrase would become operative in Isaac's life. Genesis 25, 21, after waiting and waiting and waiting, he, Isaac, prayed to the Lord for Rebekah, and God answered his prayer. This is the thing about Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. We can find our own frustrations in the process of waiting and waiting and waiting. But that little phrase is so operative, at the appointed time. When did Isaac come into the world? At the appointed time. When did Jesus come into the world? At the appointed time. What is God doing in your life? The things he wants to do at the appointed time. Remember, this, this includes this excruciating waiting. But the promise is sure. Over and over and over again, I will do this. I will do this. I will do this. When will you do it, Lord? At the appointed time. This is where, again, our story intersects with Christ's story. Jesus comes at the appointed time through a very, very long wait. What compounds our frustrations in the wait? Well, the same things that compounded the frustrations of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, right? Let's just take matters into our own hands. You promise something, Lord. Maybe I will bring it to fruition. So Abraham chooses Hagar, and he begins his line through Hagar, except Ishmael is not Isaac. God had a promise. He was going to continue his line through the son that he was going to produce. And the same thing holds true even as we come to Jesus. God is going to choose his son. He's going to have his son come from heaven to earth through the line here, Joseph and Mary. But what compounds the problem and the mess is our inability to wait. We take matters into our own hands. But what's so great about God is he continues to overrule. He accomplishes his plan through the mess, through the waiting, through some of the horrific decision-making. And so we go back to the promise. I will bless the nations through your line. I will do it. Despite all of the decision-making, the scandals and circumstances, I will accomplish my promise. I read one good quote that stuck with me the entire week. And the quote is this. God said it, said it, and that settles it. God said it, that settles it. If I could just remember that, I could probably alleviate a lot of my frustration by coming back to be relying on his word. He said it, and that settles it. The seeming hopelessness and difficulty of the men show us God is accomplishing what he wanted to do, and the seeming hopelessness and difficulty of the women in Abraham's line to David, God is again accomplishing what he said he would do. If you look at verses 3 through 6, you see the, the presence of three women here. You go a little bit farther and you see the presence of another woman and the wife of Uriah being Bathsheba. I'm not going to get to that uh, right away here, but we're going to look at just Tamar, Rahab, and Ruth. It's really, really important that we focus in on this because they aren't here by accident. They're inserted into the line to teach us a lesson. The first woman ever mentioned in Jesus' line isn't exactly the one that gives us a lot of hope as we think of the person of Tamar, who dressed up like a prostitute to entice Judah to produce an heir. That's part of the story from Genesis 38. It's one of the most scandalous parts of the story. That in the inability to have an heir, she, she seduces her own father-in-law. She dresses up like a prostitute. He goes in to be with her, and they indeed have, uh, uh, they produce an heir or two father of Perez and Zerah by Tamar. It's, it's amazing here that the Bible doesn't pull any punches. The Bible doesn't leave out anything as it relates to the royal line of Jesus. But make sure that we understand that even that far back, that there is a mess that is happening here. But out of the mess, God is overruling. And we see this huge moral question mark hanging like a flag over her and him being Judah, but how God continues to work. He continues to work. 
if that isn't enough, that we're introduced to Rahab. Salmon, the father of Boaz, Boaz by Rahab. Well, who was Rahab? Rahab was a common prostitute who bravely hid the spies who were coming to search out the promised land as they were coming out for the sake of the Israelites. While engaging in her own means of staying alive, she believes in God and is actually mentioned in Hebrew as being great in the faith. She's extolled in the book of James as having a faith that produces real works. In her time, in her real time, God made a dramatic way to preserve her life out of certain death. In this story, okay, someone engaged in a work that, that we, you know, we, we sort of shudder to think about, God uses that woman to be able to preserve his people to, to then, to, 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 to preserve a line going forward so that we might see a king being born. And what do we see over, over her life? This, this huge kind of moral question mark fluttering like a flag. And yet, God continues his work through her, giving us all hope, giving us all hope. Which then leads to Ruth, Boaz the father of Obed by Ruth, and Obed the father of Jesse, Jesse the father of David the king. Trusting in God that he would continue his plan, she follows Naomi, she steals into the night, she goes and lays under the covers of Boaz. Of all things, she does a potentially scandalous things in the eyes of many. And yet God overrules that situation, that potential compromising of position, gives Ruth, gives Boaz to Ruth, or Ruth to Boaz, however you want to look at it, to continue the line that would ultimately end up with David and then to Jesus. And what you see again is this, in this line, a huge moral question mark like a flag fluttering over the entire lineage. You know, if perfection were the glory of Jesus' family line, then I guess we'd all be a little bit in despair. Because just look at you know, all these perfect people. But if grace is the glory in the line of Jesus' family, then we can all take incredible joy. If grace is the point, then we all have joy and hope. Because when we look at a mess like this, we don't need to literally look that far probably from our own families. And yet God continues to work through these situations at his appointed time and in his way to bring forth his son. And that's what's so wonderful about God. He has a way of doing this over and over and over again. Through all the mess and horrific decision making, he has a plan to bring about Jesus. And in the same way, as you think about yourself, through the mess, through the difficulty, through some of the horrific decision making, he has a plan to accomplish something in your life by bringing you to Jesus, even if it's right now. You look back on your life, maybe if you've come to Christ and you think, I, I can't believe I got to some of the places I got to. That's God's grace. You look at today and maybe you haven't come to know the person, the Lord Jesus Christ, in a personal way. I'm telling you, what happened, has happened in your life has brought you to this moment right here for you to be able to have a conversation, a confrontation with Jesus that you might be able to see that the point of your entire life is God's grace. God's grace. He's preserved you to a point where you can hear about Jesus now. He's done that over and over and over again through the Old Testament. And you know, it's amazing here. If you look at the life of Mary, she's a bit of a scandal, isn't she? You know, here she is pregnant. Joseph says, you know, I think I'll just divorce her quietly. I don't want to be a part of this a bit of a moral question mark fluttering like a flag over her head. In a bit of solidarity, really, with Ruth and Tamar, right? And Rahab in some way. Just a flag fluttering over her head. How would God do something like this? Well, he's not going to do it in the way that we think he's going to do it. He's not going to do it in a conventional way. And he's going to show you that by grace he's going to bring his son and by grace he's going to bring you to his son. And as we look at a story like this, especially the Christmas story, we can just see our lives in the middle of it. Seemingly hopeless circumstances. What is he going to do? He's going to preserve your life by grace. You know, I, I, 
we got home last night and we got into a show about these triplets in the 80s who were identical and they were all separated at birth. And the show was about their stories. Where they went with their life and how similar they were and how different they were. And there was, there was a bit of tragedy in the story as it related to um, them being a part of basically an experiment they knew nothing about. But the cool part of the story that I, I enjoyed in it, at least one of the parts I enjoyed in it, was seeing um, the, the film and the pictures from their adopted family. And how each one of the boys had an adopted family that loved them so much. And how reliant they became at some times in their life on their adoptive family. And it just made me think about, you know, this Christmas season, while difficulty may abound, there is a hope that comes through understanding that we are adopted into a family by an eternal father and a son who's given his life. And that while you might look at whatever is happening in your own family and say, I don't know what God is up to, that by faith you know that you've been adopted by the Father who is perfect, by your elder brother being now the one who walks with you, who loves you. And even through some of the difficulty, God says, I have a plan for you. You can have hope this season. I've brought my son into your life. By grace, he's now your older brother. You can turn to him. You can talk to him. Maybe the biggest silver lining of a season like this is just that understanding. And as we look at a story like this, again, we come back to the fact that, you know, all the families of the earth will be blessed through an enduring king. How is that even possible? Well, it becomes possible when our difficulty and our circumstances take us to a point of dependence, a point of trust. We truly say during this season of time, I'm going to trust you. I'm going to trust you the most. That's what this story is all about. Let me pray. Father, you are so good to us. You continue to show your blessings over and over and over again. And as we reflect on those blessings today, Lord, and this season, as we think about the coming of Jesus into this world, we pray that you'll give us a hope, Lord, that the difficulty will lead us to a dependence, a trust. That trust will increase, Lord, through this season of time. We thank you for the messiness of the lineage of Jesus. It reminds us that it wasn't perfection that came before him, even though he was the perfect one, that it was a bit of a mess. Father, as we think about these things, give us a hope. Give us joy. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen.